Hey, everybody. It's Bea Williams with Ben Kinney Company's Place, Her Best Life, Empire Building, and all the things that I do. And today is Wednesday at noon Pacific, so that means we are here and we are going to give you a phenomenal uh, weekly agent training webinar. I am super, super excited to have um, Adam Grady and Claire from the Grady Roy Treat team, and they're going to talk everything listings today, and I'm super excited to dive in. Uh, but first, we're going to do something we've never done, something a little different. Um, you, who you see in front of you is Chris Callahan and Gina Callahan. And Chris and I went to Westmont College together. We won't share when, Chris, because we're a little old. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't, we won't share that part. And um, Chris texted me last week something that really touched my heart. And so I was just hoping that um, we could use this platform to not only help um, Chris and Gina, but to help, uh, there's a lot of children in Ukraine that need our help. So I just asked them if they would come on and share their story and share how we can help get some children out of the Ukraine that, um, that belong with their families here. So with that, thank you, Chris and Gina, for coming and telling your story. Can you just fill everybody in with what's going on? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having us and letting us share our story. Um, we do want to recognize it's not just our story. There's uh, a few hundred families that are in the same situation that we're in. Um, back in summer of 2019, we hosted a little girl from Ukraine. Her name was Stefa. Um, we had her for about five weeks, just fell madly in love with her. She's just the sweetest little spitfire you've ever met. Um, and we started the adoption process. So we've been in the adoption process for a couple of years now. Um, it's a long, arduous process, uh, full of lots of documents and, um, and it just takes a lot of time. Um, so fast forward, in January 17th of this year, we were actually approved to adopt. And we were so excited for about an hour <laughs> when we came to the realization that um, Russia had evacuated their embassy in Ukraine. And we just had this pit in our stomach of where is this headed? What What is happening right now? Um, what are we going to do? How are we going to get this girl safe? Um, it was a very hard few weeks um, and scary. Thankfully, her orphanage director had the foresight to have a plan in place, and he got all the kids, there was 130 in total, got them out of Ukraine into a neighboring country within a day of war starting, which was pretty wow. remarkable. Pretty remarkable. There are a lot of orphanages that are stuck in Ukraine right now. Um, you know, they had a very scary uh, trip through uh, Ukraine. They were actually located in Kiev. Um, and so went into Poland and then from Poland to a neighboring country. Um, they saw bombs. They saw shooting. They saw a whole lot of trauma um, in their travels. And now they're... They're settling in and they are in a hostel at the moment. Um, and we are in a quandary because our adoption is paused and that we fully understand um, Ukrainian government is fighting for their lives at the moment, not able to process adoptions. So we understand that that's paused for now. But what we're requesting is that we get to host her like we have in the past. We've actually hosted her three times in our home through the years for a total of probably five months or more. Um, so she's familiar with this house. She calls us mom and dad. She asks constantly when she can come home. Um, she Every time we talk to her, we're able to FaceTime with her, you know, almost on a daily basis. And every time we talk to her, she asks to go up to her room so she can see her room and her stuffed animals and her toys, make sure nothing's been moved. Um, and I can't remember if you texted me that, Gina, or if I read it and it broke. That's what broke my heart was that she had to have that reassurance of seeing her room. I was like, oh. It's really hard. 
it's very hard because when she asks to come home, we don't have an answer for her right now. Um, so what we're requesting from our government is to allow these kids to come over and be hosted for the interim until Ukraine gets its footing and can pursue and finish up the adoptions we've been working on for years. And as I said at the beginning, we're one of 200 families that are in this situation with a total of around 300 kids because a lot of the families are trying to adopt siblings. Um, so there's 300 kids out there who knows where they're at um, in all these neighboring countries who have a home, they have parents, they have you know, a, a constant, they've been here before, they've been hosted, every single one of them have been hosted here before. So it, we don't feel like it's a big ask, um, considering that, you know, we've already been approved to do this numerous times, we've done it numerous times, and these kids have been here numerous times. Um, so right now we're asking um, on Thursday, April 7th, we are asking to do a call day, a call your representatives um, and show your support to these families. These families are all over the United States. I, I think probably every state is represented. Um, and uh, so if you would call your congressmen, your senators and just say, hey, I'm calling in support of these families who are trying to host children that they've hosted before. Um, that's what we're requesting right now. And Chris, you went, you, you were able to go see her and visit her, correct? Yeah, I was. I, uh, <clears throat> I was able to make it there for her 11th birthday, which was pretty amazing. We decided um, when they left Kiev and we figured out, let's figure out where she's going to land. And once we determined with the uh, communication with the director of the orphanage, um, once we figured out where they actually were going to land, I immediately jumped on a plane and uh, took off and landed in Zurich and got into Germany and and that's a quite the God story of of uh, ultimately finding her that night. But um, yeah, half my luggage was nothing but wrapped up gifts for her and ma managed to make it there. It was really really special. So um, wow. hung out. But for, you couldn't bring her home with you. I mean, yeah. that's that's what we're talking couldn't about. Even, yeah. Couldn't even bring her. I mean, it was it was like pretty tight security. They had, you know, fencing and gates and the whole bit. But um, I was able to hang out with her every day for a little while um, outside the gates with a volunteer kind of watching us, which was odd because I mean, this is our daughter. You know, I mean, it's like mm -hmm. it. Uh, she comes running up to the gate, gives me a hug, and and yet at the same time, there's got to be a volunteer hanging out with us. You know, outside. It's just it's it's uncomfortable, but. Um, a lot of a lot of patience for a dad that is you know daily spending an hour with your kid and then having to leave and go back to your hotel and hang out by yourself it was it was tough i was initially going to be one week and i ended up being almost three um okay. thinking that we were trying to get a you know way to get a post visa and bring her back with me but um that was really tough to leave really really hard uh, to, to leave her there and and um and come back home so but is is this a, a U.S. government issue or a Ukrainian government issue or both? How can our senators and representatives help with this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the what's going on is there the State Department is not looking close enough at our particular situations. Um, they're just kind of blanket. Ukraine just blanket said no no visas period for any of these kids, which by the way, we think that's great. You got to really watch human trafficking. Uh, I think that the overall protection for them, I think that was very smart, but we need, we now need to get somebody to look at a deeper level and go, wow, these are every single one of these kids has been in these homes before. This is not, this is totally different than a lot of these other situations of just people saying, well, Hey, I'll, I'll take a kid. There's a lot of preparation and documentation that needs to be done prior to hosting. And, um, and then what we've already gone through for full adoption is even another level. I mean, we're talking FBI clearances of every state that you've ever lived in. I mean, it's, 
It's very extensive. So they, we need somebody to take a deeper dive and look and go, these situations are different than just this blanket, you know, people trying to, to host kids that have never been hosted before. These are, these are our family. And so it's just, we want somebody to take a, a harder look, you know? And yeah, that, I, that's what we don't see happening right, quite yet. Thank you for that clarification. And I feel like it would be more effective if we're all going to call our state. Um, so actually, it would be our our our, our senators and rep representatives that we're calling, right? That yeah. we're called that you that you want us to call tomorrow. I feel like, um, correct me if I'm wrong, and I understand there's privacy, but I feel like saying you need to pay more attention to the, if you're in California, by the way, the Callahans are in California. So, you know, um, certainly if you're in their district, but, you know, a senator would, would cover the whole state. But I feel like it would be more effective to say, hey, we need you to look more into the Callahan's file or the Smith's file or Jane Doe's file. Like, I feel like it would be almost more effective to give a name like in your own state and say, hey, we, because because you can call and say that to a senator or rep and they're like, okay, we'll pay more attention to it. But I, I almost feel like it, it needs to be attached to a file that they're working on or something. Do you know what I mean? I'm just wondering how we can make the calls more effective. Um, we actually have a template that- I, Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> that, that's uh, great. We have a template that I'll send to you. Um, you know, I think in most cases, just say the Callahan's because we don't have that all organized as to what family is in what state. Um, I can certainly find out you're in Washington, correct? Yeah, but our, our viewers and listeners are, are um, well, they're all over the world, but they're all over the, the country. We will, um, when when you guys hop off, if you send that, Robin will will post that here um, mm -hmm. to anybody, um, you know, watching this. And, and even if you're watching this on replay, and I, I would say if it's after Thursday the 7th, call anyway. Like it's, you know, it's it's just we're, we're doing one day to bring awareness, but keep calling. Like, I don't think it's a one day thing. Mm -hmm. That would be phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I just want to thank you guys for so transparently sharing your story. It really touched me. And, and I think that it's going to touch other people here. I hope it does. Um, we have amazing, amazing audience that, that uh, cares a lot. And I have a feeling that, um, that they're going to be really impacted by what they hear and that they're going to follow through on this. In fact, I know they will. So thank you guys so much. And um, we'll post information on how they can get, you know, the template. And um, we will do our best to dig up um, a list of state senators and representatives. I'm sure it exists somewhere. I, with, I with, have that template as well. So also, oh, you're you, the best. All oh, you have you're to do the is plug in your, your zip code and it'll, Perfect. it'll pull up your, your people. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, we'll post all of that for everybody. So, and we'll also throw that on Ben Kinney Agent Training. If you guys want to get on there, um, we'll just put it right at the top for you also. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Chris and Dina. I appreciate you. I really Thank do. You. Take care. All right. Good luck. Hope I'll follow your story. Thank you. All right. Um, it's hard to transition from that, isn't it? Uh, isn't it, guys? But but we're going to, and um, you know, we're gonna. Um, hopefully, um, uh, you guys are gonna. Um, you're gonna help with that, uh, at, uh, Robin. I think you're going to spotlight me and Adam and Claire. I'm not sure. I'm just going to wait for that for two seconds. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, hi. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> oh, good. How are you guys? Oh, good. Are, do you guys have kids at all? We do. I have an 11 year old, so that hits hard. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. And, and it's, you know, it's why I brought him on. It doesn't make it easy for us right now in the transition, but um, I just think about all the effects of war on children and see, I'm going to cry, you know, and I think of um, the fact that there's all these homes that can take them and that have already been approved. So I'm a crier though. So I do this a lot. It's got to get past the red tape, right? I know. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. And here's the cool thing. The cool thing is that if you guys who are watching and listening, if you want to increase your business, it, it's actually benefiting the world in a massive way because the more you increase your business and do better in business, the more money you can give away and the more time you can spend making the world a better place. So it actually 
does make sense that we transition into business, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, for, for a lot of us, we do this so that, you know, money is good for the good it could do. And so, you know, a lot of these families are probably going to need help flying with flights and getting the, you know, getting kids out when they, when they finally get released. And there, there's a lot of wonderful things that money can do. And if you're in the real estate business, Adam and Claire, what is the one thing we have to do to last? We have to get listings, right? Correct. We have to list to last. So um, I, I couldn't think of, you know, a better duo to have on to just have like this, just down and dirty workshop on like how the heck you guys are getting so many listings right now. And I just, I just wanted to spend time with you guys and kind of an informal discussion, having you tell us all your tricks, all your secrets. (laughs) So Adam, um, uh, you and I met uh, in person, which was really lovely um, a couple months ago. Thank you for breakfast. <laughs> uh, you're located in, in Kansas, is that right? No, we're in Springfield, Missouri. You're in Springfield, Missouri, and then your your partner's in Kansas, in correct? Wichita, yes. In about, Wichita. Uh, four hours from us. Okay, so sorry. So I was, you know, in my head, I... That's okay. Yeah, yeah I was so the, the grad team, The grading team's in South West Missouri. Okay, and, got uh, it. The Roy team is in Wichita. And together you are Grady Roy. The Grady Roy Network, yeah. And when did you guys partner up together? A few years ago, um, you know, we were already, we had already expanded and we were in Joplin, which is about an hour and 20 minutes toward Wichita. And um, we were doing really well there. And um, Josh Roy was my MAPS coach and had been for about five years at the time. And um, I was telling him how we were moving into the Kansas City market and talking to him about strategy and all the things we were doing. And he was like, I have to be transparent with you. We're also moving into the Kansas City market, you know? And uh, I'm like, so this is your right. coach. Your coach yeah. is moving in on your turf. <laughs> it's exactly right. You know, it just, it wasn't lost on me what an asset Josh Roy was and what we could do together. And in the Heartland region, um, where Josh and I both exist in, inside the Keller Williams network, you know, we, we would compete for that number one spot and we would always tease each other about it. And I would tease him, you know, one day we'll just join forces and we'll take over everything. And this was just that opportunity, yeah. you know, um, expansion is important to me because it gives the people I'm in business with more opportunity. Yeah, I'm fine with the hub. Like we do great here, but you know, Claire, for instance, how do I, how do I take an ISA and get them from a hundred grand to 200 grand, right. To 300 grand. Well, I could do that. Right. If we had that many markets that we were calling. And so Claire's our director of lead gen. And when we combined forces, Claire immediately took over the ISA department uh, at the Wichita hub and grew that. And she has 13 ISAs. Is that right now? Oh, I cannot wait to, to dive in. So for all of our listeners and viewers who don't know what ISA means, which I know sounds crazy, but I get that question right. a lot. Sure. Uh, no, it's okay. It, it's something that I think a lot of us assume other people know. And uh, I get that question almost every webinar and podcast. <laughs> so um, do you want to kind of walk through what an ISA is? I'll give that to Claire. Yeah, Claire. So Claire, we're, we're introducing you. You're the director of lead gen and you're based out of where? I'm in Springfield, Missouri. You're in Springfield, Missouri as well. Perfect. Yeah. Do, why don't you explain to us what an ISA is, Claire? Yeah. So we uh, obviously it's short for uh, inside sales associate. Uh, we, um, you will hear some teams talk about maybe an OSA, which is more an outbound, um, all of our ISAs, uh, do both. So, you know, any name, phone number, we are happy to call it regardless of how it came in. Yeah. So you do outbounding and, and inbounding. And I think that is an important yeah. distinction because not everybody does just out of curiosity. Uh, Adam said you had, uh, 13, 13 of them. Do, does, does everybody do inside and outside or do you have some OSAs, some ISAs? Right now, everybody still does uh, inside and outside. So obviously inside uh, leads coming in, uh, convert better, faster. Uh, we typically have already paid for them uh, and possibly. So uh, they're always first priority yet. Everybody typically has a uh, an hour, two, three, uh, depending on what they're calling that day. Um, and if there's nothing else to call, you know, we're going to the database uh, or we're going outside the database to find business. 
Okay. Well, well, let, let's start there, and and I'll open this question up to either either of you. Um, why don't you talk about like how many houses you sell, and and you can either use the last twelve months or or twenty twenty one. That's fine, but you know, give or take, how many buyers and how many sellers you guys serve, so that everyone can get an idea of like your volume and how many transactions you do. Sure. It's a lot. Um, do you want to buy hub or our network? Why don't you get both, actually? I think that'd be interesting. Um, so in our Springfield hub, um, Claire was 680. Sorry, it was 618 in our Springfield oh. hub. And then we did uh, 1,411 transactions as a network. And how many buyers, how many sellers? I'm taking notes. So we're uh, about 55, 45 sellers. 55 sellers. Okay. Oh, that's a great mix. That's just really perfect. And you literally be able to maintain that even with the, the change in the market, you know, and a lot of people, you, we see their buyers numbers really dropping because buyers are so much more difficult right now. And historically the buy side is ran by less experienced people, right? Because they're the easier one. And so when we're looking at other teams numbers, it seems to be that, that shift that we're seeing. And, and we've been able to maintain that. So we're really proud of that. You know, it's interesting because I've actually seen people's listings numbers drop in this market, um, as I interview people, it's been, it's been the listings, um, cause it's just really competitive to get listings right now. Sure. And so they managed to spread out geographically. I'm noticing a lot more geographic spread right now with buyers to just find them that house. Um, because in every market around the U S it's just been crazy. So, so with that said, so, you know, if, if you look at your hub, so 618, you know, roughly 340 ish, or, math, but 340 ish say, uh, are listings. That's a lot of listings. And, you know, I just want to kind of spend time together today, diving into how you got that many listings. Right. And, and what does a predictable flow of business look for you guys? Cause I think that's really the goal of any agent or team watching this, you know, how can I create a predictable flow of business, right. That I can hire around and feel comfortable and secure hiring around. So why don't we start with lead sources? Uh, what are your top two or three lead sources? So you had asked me just to back up for two seconds, you know, about mm -hmm. that when we met. And um, I told you that the predictable listings come from the predictable lead gen. Yeah. Right? And we probably should start there. And that's why I thought it was important to bring Claire on today since she runs all that. So I'll let her take that question. Go ahead. Cool. Thank you for it. That was great. That was a great, um, I like that a lot. Yeah, so the, the predictable lead gen, you know, all of our leads are managed by our inside sales agents um, until they get to the point where they've met with an agent and the agent wants to keep the appointment. You know, when our agents meet with somebody, they can decide if they keep them or if they stay with the ISA for a while longer. And so all of that lead gen is on uh, the ISA team. And we do feel that creates a lot of predictability. You know, we um, have standards. All the ISAs talk to at least 40 people uh, or more a day, uh, voice to voice, um, a little bit of text, obviously, with, uh, with the way technology is. Uh, but most of it is a significant voice to voice conversation. And um, we have a great uh, process flow kind of through the system um, that makes sure that we're keeping the leads um, uh, connected with on a reasonable basis based off of their lead source or, or their timeline or whatever, whatever that may be. And, and we audit that and make sure we don't leave anybody uh, behind. So, so Claire, you said something, um, you said something interesting to me. Um, you talk about some ISAs, and I think it's just important to distinguish because some ISAs hand nurtures over to agents. What I think I'm hearing you say, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you guys are appointment setters. You, you bring them through appointments and, and, and then Adam, you are handing your agents appointments. That's correct. And, and it's interesting. I, the reason I paused on that is that I had a mindset shift around that this year. Um, and, and a lot of it's just based on two straight years of interviewing agents and teams. You just learn a thing or two. And that is that there's three different lead types now that, that we focus on for my team. There's the, what they self-generate, you know, what my team agents self-generate. There's leads that come from the team, and then there's appointments. And appointments are the hardest thing in real estate. Appointments are the number one driver of any real estate business. 
You tell me how many appointments and what your conversion rate is. There's your predictability. There is your entire business, right? Mm -hmm. So I just felt like it was kind of worth it to point that out because like you said it so well, Claire, you know, you were like, well, you know, in our case, we bring them to appointment. Is there ever a time where you don't, where you like kind of say, hey, agent, I think you should come in or is it pretty much just no, like you guys stick with them? You mean after the appointments are No, I mean, if you're unable... I mean, if you're unable to get an appointment, yeah. do you ever toss some nurtures over to the agent to see if the agent can get an appointment or do you a hundred percent, that's it. Like you only give them appointments. Yeah, we, we only give, we only give them appointments. Um, if we do happen to just toss them, maybe a showing, maybe it's somebody who's adamant, maybe they're a lawyer, they're only going to work, you know, they can write their own contract. They only want to work with the, with the listing agent. Those would be really small one offs, but no, we qualify. Um, it, the one thing we might do is have another ISA take it over. If we feel that lead, uh, we try to have that mentality internally. It's not just about what's best for me. It's about what's best for the team. And if you have maybe a first sell by owner that you're not getting anywhere with, we ask that you have another ISA take it over and see if they uh, connect with them. Because just like with agents, some ISA, some personality types connect with other people uh, better. And uh, we really try to make it about what's best for the team. We don't want an agent to miss out on an appointment just because we weren't able to make a connection or able to get past an objection. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that you talked to, thank you. Um, you talked about, you know, give or take each ISA might talk to 40 people a day. If you have 13 ISAs, that is 400, 520. Did I do math right? About 500 people a day, Yeah. which is about 2,500 people a week, which is about 10,000 people a month. Did I do math right? You yeah, it. it was, we had 11,000 last month. I just finished wow. adding them up last month. Yeah. Okay. So how many appointments would that yield? Wow. That's amazing. So, I appreciate the fact that Claire's actually looking it up and giving me the exact number right now. Yeah. I mean, ish. Claire, it can be ish. <laughs> but I love her. I know. I kind of love it too. Jesus. And so we had almost 300 fanatic. appointments. Yeah. Okay. Across so the network, we had 300 appointments. So yeah. 300 and, and, and I started, I actually started to ask you source and we got completely sidetracked. I'm now realizing because I'm just, I get in the weeds on this stuff. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's pull back for one second. What is the primary source? So, so 10,000 ish contacts a month, are they primarily database repeat clients? Are there any cold leads in there? Yeah, there's definitely cold leads. You know, when I when I personally talk about database leads, I'm typically talking old database leads um, that are in some sort of um, unclaimed status. They didn't do business with us, never answered that sort of thing. Um, our inside sales agents uh, take care of all of the past clients. So uh, those numbers would include quarterly calls uh, to our past clients. Um, those are kind of the non-negotiables, right? All leads get answered immediately and uh, past clients get contacted on a quarterly basis. Those are some really too hard and fast rules we have uh, in our system. And then obviously there's uh, a bunch of inbound leads. I was looking through listing, uh, you know, I was getting numbers earlier. I wasn't sure exactly what direction we were taking, but, you know, listing wise, repeat referral, uh, past client business that, I'm um, sorry, SOI uh, mm -hmm. and repeat referral uh, top source. It's about 60 to 70% of our, our business uh, right underneath that uh, is sign calls. And then not too far down from that is still FISBOs expires and some internet traffic. <laughs> So FISBOs what about, do you guys circle to prospect at all? We do. Uh, we do with the purpose. Um, we want to have a message or a story we're telling people when we call. Um, I'll be honest, though, it's it's been tough. We've been doing a lot of calling and texting. Um, numbers show up as spam more often than not anymore. And that's been really tough for like a circle call. Um, you know, we're more likely to show up with spam, their phones, not familiar with our number, that sort of thing. Yeah. That it's, makes sense. Uh, yeah. It's tough, but we do it. If we have a buyer that wants to be in an area, um, if we have a hot property or a story to tell, we will, uh, we will call the area. I do want to clarify something because I was listening to what you were, how you were describing your SOI at some level. Um, 
So it sounds like you pay for leads and they come in and they start searching on your IDX on your website. And at some point they registered, right? So I think what I'm hearing you saying, are you calling your pond? Are you kind of calling your, your fishing pond account? Is this just an account in your CRM that has everybody that's registered at some point? Uh, yes, it would be anybody that's registered or we've added to the database that maybe didn't transact with us. Um, yeah. All of our new leads, I don't use a pond feature for new leads. They all go right to an inside sales agent who's going to nurture them with a specific plan or follow up. Um, but after 14 days of not answering or um, if they've answered and maybe they met Springfield, Illinois, not Springfield, Missouri, right? Or they can't get approved. We try to get them approved. They can't get approved. They're not anywhere within a year or two. That's when they would go to maybe a pond that um, they have some sort of drip running on them. And then we do uh, have a goal to call that at least three or four times a year as well. Okay. Okay. And yeah. then with that, I, I want to stay on that a little bit. I'm, I'm fascinated by this volume. How many people do you have in your CRM then? Um, we have 30 between expansion and I, I would say with um, Wichita, okay. it's probably close to 60,000. 60,000. And, mm -hmm. and okay. And so um, how long have you been paying for, how long have you been feeding that? Um, what did we do? Maybe three years ago, Adam, I've been here. You got up to years. 60. And we years? started, yeah. Uh, Josh does not pay for internet traffic. Um, ads. So yeah, that, so one of the things with when, when Adam brought me on, one of the things I started doing that we weren't doing before is recording every sign call gets added to the system, right? Think of how many times your phone rings as an agent and you don't actually, not only do you not write it down on a piece of paper, but then you don't transfer it to the CRM. And, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot. Maybe your phone rings four times a day, maybe it's eight times a day with a lead, but oh, I mean, day over day, over day, over day. And that's a lot of leads that you're leaving on the table that could be nurtured. You know, people buy and sell every three, five, seven years, just, just because it's not a lead now, doesn't mean it's not a good lead a couple of years from now. So, um, I, oh, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, um, you know, because we, we get a lot of inquiries from a lot of team. We talk to a lot of people, um, people call and ask me for coach calls, and we talk about that often. And often I hear that the agent, whether that's the listing agent, the buyer agent, the on-call agent, every team's got a different term for it. They are, they're the ones taking the inbound calls, right? And they're not paying the ISA to take those. And what we're finding is that it ends up on a piece of paper, in their front seat, right? And it never gets added to the system. And there's so much value in that lead and being able to track what that lead's doing, how they're acting and, and when they're gonna transact again, that we have that information that other teams don't have because they're circumventing the ISA department and giving it straight to the agent. Mm -hmm. And so how I would definitely advocate if anybody's listening that's doing that to rethink their, um, their strategy and how that lead flows through to their office. Yeah, I think that's really smart. That's We've value. been focused a lot on LFL this year and sign calls are definitely part of that, how to get two pieces of business for every listing you have. Right. Do you guys track that separately, sign calls? Do you, do you have a conversion rate for that? We do. Go ahead, Claire. You've got it in front of you. I, d I don't have the total conversion. I can tell you we did 80 transactions last year from well, 80 closed transactions from sign Is call that 80 year. from your whole network or in the hub? Uh, that would have been just Springfield. So that's 80 out of 618 is more than 10%. That's a big, and those are free. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. That is literally what I've been talking about. That is how my friends, you take a listing and you get I mean, if you brought on 240 listings or so, what did we say? You, 340. Or 340? Yeah, mm -hmm. 340. 80 of those just from sign calls alone, you're getting another piece of business. Kudos. I, I, I think that's superb. Why I can emphasize what I just said uh, again, right? Because the agent that's supposed to be taking it is on a show me, you know, walking people through a house isn't able to answer right away, or if they're able to answer, they're trying to serve two masters and give this people the information on the property, but they're also trying to show their client, right? They're busy. They're distracted. They have things going on where the inside sales agent is in a quiet office. I mean, look at Claire's space, right? Yeah. 
and they're focused on that incoming lead and converting that lead. And if they're unable to convert that lead, they're at least starting to put them on, on a nurture system and there's going to be a follow-up done there. And instead, you're rushing to write this down on the yellow notepad, throwing it in your front seat onto your next appointment, and it's not being followed up with in a timely manner, and we're taking that business from you. Yeah, um, 100%. I think, it's, uh, I think it's really smart and really well said. So so you know your conversion from that source. Um, I, I, I would say that, that a lot of who you're describing, like database and sphere of influence, I, I understand what you're saying. It would be interesting to me down the road to have you separate out who registered, like who just came from an internet lead versus, you know, who is actually like a sphere of influence. But I, I, I don't, I, I understand why you group them the same. I, I sort of get that because once they're in the system, they're in the system and they're being nurtured um, with your brand name, there's a familiarity. So I, I totally understand. No, you know, we, do, we do separate those. Like mm. the, the source stays on it till they transact. So mm. I do, even though they're all in the same pond, we call them at a similar frequency. The oh. source stays on them till they transact. Got so it. their first okay. transaction will mark with their original source. And then after that, they're considered a, a past client and we mark them that way. The reason yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Us, we want to know if we've paid for that lead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. We want to know if they, yeah, have that's what I want to know. That's what I'm thinking. Or walking yeah. the dog and called on a sign. Right. Or if they right. came through an actual different source, because we want to either. Pull ROI. A, well, yeah, that's exactly right. We want to pull an additional lever in that category or maybe you know, throw that category to the wayside because it's not working for us. Like you want to know where yeah. the, the actual lead's coming from. Yeah, that's exactly where my head went. You know, as a as a team owner, I'm like, you know, I need to I need to track that. Well, that's great. Um, how how about um, how about open houses? Do you guys um, how do you do at open houses? Do you get listings from open houses? We do. We've historically been very successful at open houses. Um, this market's changed it a little bit, right? Because um, yep you know, being strategic about having the time to actually have the open house or once we get the open house open, you know, how many offers are in place and, you know, buyers just kind of shut down. And so we haven't had them as much in the past 12 to 18 months that we normally have, but historically we've always been very successful with open house. Oh, so you must be one of those markets. So you don't hold your offer for offer reviews. We don't, you know, it's, it's very rare that we do. Yeah. So that I struggle with that because I don't understand. So, okay. Just like, I don't want to get into a debate, but I markets that don't do that, I guess, because when I give the market three or four days to get everybody through to see the house and to spend the time they compete. I just sold a listing two weeks ago for 500,000 over asking price. Now, if I would have sold that listing 12 hours after I listed, it would have sold at full price. I made my clients a half a million dollars by holding that. So I do struggle a little bit with not holding them for, for the marketplace to give the marketplace time and to give multiple people time to go through a property. So I like, I'm baffled. So it's just something that you're, it just doesn't happen in your, in your real estate environment. So it it doesn't, it doesn't. So our average sales price is just over $200,000 in our area, or excuse me, in our, um, in our, in our, our uh, uh, Springfield hub, right? I'll say it, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll isolate it to the hub. So when you take yeah. it to county, right? And so we just, things happen a little bit differently than they would happen in a large metro area like yours. Um, we have a lot less cash. You know, we have a lot of FHA, mm-hmm. USDA buyers, right? And so when we're getting five to 10 offers, our best stuff's already there. Got it. Holding okay. It, what we have found is holding it for three or four days only upsets our first people that were mm. ended up being our best offers anyway. Yep. And we're finding that consistently because I, you're, you're right. And on a na- from a national standpoint, I'm hearing everybody beating your drum and saying, Hey, this is really best practice to start on Thursday, do through yeah. Sunday, you know, kind of that 72 hours sold. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it worked really well. We just haven't had to do that. You know, we're getting really good, um, and you know your market and that's the right decision for your market. You know, when, when you're selling, you know, 618 homes, I, I am going to defer to you, you know, and that makes total sense to me. And that is interesting. I haven't really thought about it that way, that it's a lot of it's, I haven't thought about that, the demographic of the market. You're right. You're right. There, there is a, it is an art because you can hold them too long and you start discouraging people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, it's, it's a fast paced market. People know what they want. I've actually shortened it by a day. 
um, since this market hit because too long people start going, Hey, peace out. It's, a, it's going to be a bloodbath. I don't, I don't want in. So, uh, it used to be, I used to list on a Thursday review on a Tuesday. I now most, you know, most of the time list on a Thursday review on a Monday. Okay. Um, you know, not always, not always. It just kind of depends, but so anyway, all right. So, um, I want to go back to Claire a little bit, Claire, with, with, with 60,000 people in your database and, you know, 618 homes and then another, I have to look at my notes here. Oh, I can't read my notes. I can't remember how many are in the network and I can't read my notes. <laughs> but, it was like, I think almost 14. It was 14. Yeah. I thought that was a four. It was written over something. <laughs> um, I would be curious to learn how, what your pipeline management looks like. And what I mean by that is what your tags are and how you, how you organize that. Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something we're always looking at and working through. Um, I'm I'm really lucky. Uh, we don't have any lead coordinators, and but we did recently bring uh, promote some of our ISAs uh, to like lead ISAs, and so I have one for each hub, one for expansion, and they help with some of the database management. Um, and we do a lot of, um, I actually use, uh, statuses, uh, which is a pretty common term in most CRMs, um, versus tagging mm -hmm. uh, tags to me. Okay. I open a lead and there's 50 tags. Like I just lose my mind. Like it is too much. Can't handle it. And, uh, it's not my favorite. Okay. Tag. I'm the opposite. I literally tell my people, I'm like, you should have 50 tags. You can't, that's what CRMs are designed for. <laughs> too many tags. I can't remember who's doing what. And so, so I do buckets, right? So in general, we have three major buckets. Some of them, there's one or two statuses per uh, bucket, but we have the people we're nurturing. So these are the people that are within 12 months. There's a couple statuses that live uh, within there to kind of show where and that they are. Um, we have our old lead pond, right? And those people are um, nurtured, they have a specific plan, they're nurtured a certain way, but in general, they're touched about the same amount of times. Mm -hmm. And then we have our past clients and SOI, which get the quarterly touches and the newsletters and things like that. Um, and so those are kind of my three big buckets. And then I use statuses to kind of give a little bit of separation um, inside of there. And then obviously the lead source. So within the status, I can then sort by lead source um, and audit that. Uh, we use tasks really, really heavily. So uh, just had somebody in my office today. I'm like, hey, where are we at with this lead? And they're like, oh, I'm on it. And I'm like, really? Because there's no task. Like if you don't have a task, you're going to lose it. I've lost hundreds by not putting a task on. Like, uh, so, we, so when we use tasks heavily, I can then, uh, most CRMs have like an emulate option, right? You can become that user or you can log in as that user. And I can literally log in and say, is everybody caught up with their tasks? And then I can go into the bucket and say, when was the last contact date? Like how far back are we on the last contact date? And that would be uh, maybe a red flag or a concern that we need to make that more of a priority. So just so I understand, I mean, I do, but I wanna make sure everyone sure. does. So we're talking like new, hot, watch and qualified, those kind of statuses that, mm -hmm. that are, um, you know, that are on the CRM. And then what I'm hearing you say is you have rules, um, you know, which you can't leave a contact without a to-do or a task. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes. In and certain buckets, the only time they can't have a task is if they're in a long-term bucket or a past client bucket, because then they're nurtured at a frequency, like a by a last contact. Okay. So basically what your ISAs come in every day and they, you know, they get their coffee because we all know that is necessary in the morning and they, um, you know, they sit down at their desk and they, there's tasks that will come up and, and to a certain extent, they're following the tasks for the day. Yeah. And then taking their inbound stuff, right? Okay. They are. So that we also have a lead schedule. So obviously our top lead source is a lot of the ones I just mentioned earlier, um, they're on a lead source schedule. So everybody's assigned to some sort of like new business that they're going to attack that day. Um, and then most of our inbound internet leads are round robin. So they're getting a little bit of that every day that they would be going in and um, using uh, and updating. And then um, they would go, they would go from there. So and, and Claire, I, I'm curious, um, so this is just a via question because I, I sometimes struggle with this. When you're leading a sales force, and make no mistake, 13 ISAs as a sales force, 
Um, what is your process as sales manager, director of lead gen? You know, what is your process for auditing their CRM? Like, do you come in every day and just how do you audit that? Um, not as, not as regularly as I, I struggle should. with it too. That's why yeah, I asked. Yeah. It's one of those things that gets pushed to the back burner until you notice an issue. Um, but you know, I have it on weekly. So I'm typically, uh, the, I, my ISAs are, are really accountable and they know that's what I expect from them and they need to be that way. Uh, they're pretty good at letting me know if they're behind because they know if I check and I find their days behind on their tasks, uh, I'm going to ask them why. And so if they're struggling to catch up, I meet with them on a weekly basis. Like they're going to tell me that. So for my ISAs, when we do their one-on-ones, I'm typically going through their CSU account. Um, our CRM right now is CR interactive. So I pull them up on CR interactive and we look at, uh, we look at their, um, their account. Part of our onboarding process for ISAs is teaching them how to audit, how to self audit their account so that we're not leaving mm. people without tasks. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah. So we do that. And then I'll audit the agents about once a month. Um, again, right. They're not keeping near as many people, but I'll log into their account. And, and it's same thing with them. We don't actually assign the lead to the agent. We just add a task plan for them. So they're getting tasks uh, to go in and update, update the lead. So it's easy for me to audit that as well. Okay. And so, um, uh, do you have, what are your goals for them? So every week, how many appointments are they expected to set? How many sales are they supposed to have? Like, what are your, what are your goals and standards for your team? Yeah. So they're a little bit different depending on the ISA. Um, uh, just like you had mentioned your conversion and how you can backtrack, uh, or forecast people's goals. Uh, we do the same with the ISA. So when they're out of their 90 days, they're going to tell me what they want to make the rest of the year or at the start of every new year, we talk about it and we backtrack based on their conversion. What do they want to make? What do they need to do um, to make that? So it's going to vary per person. I have one ISA that wants 300 units this year. And I have a, uh, a newer ISA who wants 112 units this year. So it, everybody's goals are different. Um, but we really look a, real hard at the signatures. I'm a little bit flexible on the set and the held um, because of the market we're in. It's not taking as many set or held to get to the close. Um, so for most of them, their goal is at least 12 signatures. And then, uh, you know, obviously the ISA that wanted 12 three, signatures, meaning 12 agreements a month, 12 agreements signed a month. And, it and that can, can be buyer or listing. It can be buyer or listing. Okay. Yep. Yep. And they vary from there up to, you know, 28. And just out of curiosity in your market, how many appointments might that take right now? Um, for, yeah. for one ISA right now, that's take, it'll take about double that. Okay. Time, yeah, that's a good have conversion. Some fall through that's rate good. on the held and have some fall through rate on the sign. Yeah. So to get 12, it's 24 to 30 typically. 50% conversion is really, really great. I mean, um, you know, because I'm, I, I shouldn't assume, but my <laughs> hunch is some of those convert over time. Is that, is that fair? Like some of them may not convert in that first meeting, but yeah. you know, when you look at long-term conversion, that's probably getting to 60 or 70% would be sure. my hunch. Yeah. yeah. And I actually have last year pulled up. We had uh, for listings, we had 80% met and uh, 85% signed. Like, oh, over, that's fantastic. Yeah, and you had 80% perfect. met, meaning held to uh, set to held. Is that, that's what you're talking about? 80% showed up basically. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really, that's above, that's above the industry norm. Th this is, this is fantastic. Adam, I, I, this is what I found myself thinking, you know, I was listening to Claire and I'm thinking, Adam, like, did you come up with this whole plan or did you just, you know, hire amazing people to, how did you get your start? Like, did you start kind of, you know, really organized and in your database and kind oh, of doing yeah. all of this? Totally. Yeah. And when Claire came on, she asked me all these questions, these numbers and every answer I gave her was spot on accurate. Right. <laughs> Claire. Why do I have a feeling that is not, <laughs> you know, um, I appreciate Claire so much because she just geeks out on the numbers. Right. And she loves the data and, um, she gets lost in it. Right. She gets so excited about all these new metrics. And, um, when we got into a relationship together, it was about six years ago. And, um, and we had no, I say program, we had no systems. We had no process. I gave her a phone 
like a like a phone. Like a phone. Like a like a like a phone. Like a like a phone. You know, <laughs> yep. And 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 I say that and I um in jest because it, when you think about the technology that we have now and um what we had back then was a cubicle and a phone, right? And so Claire built all of this. I mean, she built every single piece of it. Um, even six years ago, seven years ago, when we first started this process, Inside Sales Agent was really new. And um, it was. Yep. And um, I hired Claire a coach before I hired Claire. And I did mm. the first couple of coach calls with the coach. And was it your first day or second day, maybe? I think it was my second. I think my calls were on Tuesday or Wednesday and I started Monday. Yeah. And so, I mean, Anna. literally, and, um, sorry, Anna, I should give a shout out to Anna Kruger. She's absolutely a rock star. She's amazing. I love Anna. She's oh, so I love great. Her. And I don't even think she does one-on-one coaching anymore, but this was back she when- She does first- strength finders. She did my whole team in December, by the mm-hmm. way, side note, little, little, uh, we'll just go down that rabbit hole and we'll come back. She's the most amazing strength finder coach. And I, I've been coached one-on-one by many amazing coaches. And I spent an hour with her. She, I sent her my strength finders ahead of time. One of the best hours of coaching I have ever had in my life. I'm going to second that. We flew her in, um, was it two years ago? Mm-hmm. And uh, she spent a day with our team and did all of our strength finders. And it, yeah. it was really cool to see um, people that you work with every day in a different light. Yeah, I agree. Right? And I, I remember a marketing director, um, we had to go, we had to go pick a picture out that describes us. And mine was like a, a fast car, right? And it was just kind of the, the, um, the abstract of the fast car going by. And hers was like this meadow. And she's like, Adam, do you see sometimes when you drive your fast car through my meadow? And I'm like, oh, I get that, right? Yes. That made so much sense to me. And she was like, so you know what? when you rush into the office, and you tell me all of this stuff. And I'm like, I, I literally know. just texted Robin. And I'm like, we need to get Anna on. Yeah, like, so we need to get she's Anna so on good. right now. Like we're like, she's we're so going to get her on. You, you said it was a rabbit hole and we could stay down there all day, but I know. I'll, but I'll give her but that Anna Cougar, off. She got her start as an ISA, you know, for yeah. Haro's team and, yeah. and coach for that. So, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so we were one of her first coaching clients when she started um, doing maps. And um, I just wanted to learn and ask a hundred questions. And so I took some calls with her. Our um, operations director took some calls with her. Um, we were able to identify Claire. Um, and then Claire started with us and immediately started into coaching. And so Anna was challenging her and asking her all these questions that she didn't know the answer to. And so Claire would come to me and I would give Claire my one-off, off-the-cuff answer that I thought it was. And then once we started tracking all the data, my answers were so far off. The, uh, it was such a learning curve for us. You know, I'm like, wow, we're, we're not as good as we thought we were, right? Our money's not accountable like yeah. we thought it was, right? Our lead conversion isn't what we thought it was. Our agents yeah. aren't as good at closing as we thought they were. Like it was it was really eye-opening once we, we were able to track all that black and white data and Claire was to come back and show us this big picture. And so, you know, awareness does a lot of the heavy lifting. And once we were aware mm-hmm. of those numbers, you know, she was able to say, okay, let's dive deep on this metric and let's fix this metric you know, whatever it was, you know, maybe it was, um, uh, set to health, right? So what do yeah. we do to get our set to health better and then create systems and processes around getting that number up? And then we would move on to the next metric and Claire built all that by hand. So, I mean, the credit serves, I, I wish I could take credit for it. Um, cause it's phenomenal. And I think, um, she's kind of created an industry standard, um, mm-hmm. But uh, all that credit goes to her. And so, so Adam, because I, there's a lot of people watching that are like, I'm not selling 1,400 homes a year. I don't have an ISA department of 13. Let's talk about that. You didn't start that way. Uh-huh. You hired, you started hiring Claire and you learn progressively as you grew, right? Yeah. You learn one thing and then another, and then you got some experience and you thought, oh, when I focus on this metric, then good results happen. So yeah. this is the metric to lean on and you start, right? Is that Correct. fair? Yeah. yeah. And, um, I, you know, I spent my money on the stuff that was shiny, mm-hmm. right? Because it sounded good or it fed my ego, right? Not well, that's, that's the job of a good team lead, right? <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's, you know. not because it was effective. And, um, yeah. and Claire came in and, and showed us, Hey, if we spend more money here, this is what happens. Right. Yeah. That's and, right. Um, and she, like I said, she geeked out on those numbers and she was able to show us that black and white data really yeah. consistently. So we knew exactly where to spend money and where our efforts needed to be. 
And I want to I want to give everybody here a hack. Whether you are a single agent watching this, whether you are have a small, medium, large, very large team, I mean, place where the you know largest team in the nation. Here's my hack for any of you. Okay, if you don't know where to start on any of this, when we talk about ROI, which is return on investment tracking, or when we talk about you know ratios and everything, um, this is what I did. About three and a half years ago, I went from having a team to leading six brokerages and 1,300 agents overnight. Since then, we now have eight brokerages and about 1,700 agents. So we've grown a lot, right? We've grown about whatever that, 30%, 25%. And this is what I did. I, did, I knew I didn't know what I didn't know. Well, actually, I kind, of, I kind of knew what I didn't know at that point. I would say I knew what I didn't know. So all I did at first was I just started tracking raw data not understanding how I was going to use the data yet, that that's where I started because that you have to move mountains to do that, to get a whole sales team, including yourself, by the way, to track daily numbers is a lot. You have to get a system in place. In our case, we have an admin plus a VA involved. We have group texts involved. So all I did for, for the first six or 12 months was I just took raw data. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but one day I looked up and I'm like, hmm, I have 16 months of contacts, appointments set, appointments held, ins, you know, outs um, in our case, because we're, I'm running brokerages. So it's, you know, people you bring in, people you bring out. And, um, and that's when the magic happens. When you have all the raw data, then you can kind of go, okay, well, I can divide this and that. And that's going to tell me that we set an appointment with every 25 to 33% pe of people we talk to. Huh. And so I guess what I'm saying is, even if this sounds overwhelming, track the raw data to start with, even if you don't know what you're going to do with it yet, then eventually you'll get a coach or a consultant who's going to help you analyze that, or you can just do it yourself. Do you guys have, do you disagree, agree? I mean, that's how I did it. I agree. And I, um, I, I am disgusted at the amount of money that I wasted and the time that oh, I know. even more important, right? Doing things that I thought were working that weren't working. Well said. I, I mean, we've all been there. It's just part, it's kind of part of the, part of the journey, right? Part of the journey. So now um, who do you, Adam, do you take listings now? Do you, what is your role on, on, in your hub? Let's start with your hub. What's so, your role? I, I, and I don't know if you know Jim Davis or not. She and I are in the same. Oh, Jen Davis. Oh, yeah. I love Jen Davis. She's just yeah. awesome. I she and I are in, this, in the same market center and we were on the phone together the other day. I thought you said uh, Jim Davis, by the way. Oh, I did too. Sorry. I was like, who's that? Jen Davis was my oh. very first webinar this year. So if anyone wants oh, to wow. go back in the archives, she was my very first one in January. She's amazing. Yeah. And I told her the other day, I'm like, Jen, the biggest compliment. She's amazing. Is you always bring me energy, you know? She's just she awesome. Does. And she was on the phone and we were talking and I was at a listing, a leaving a listing appointment. I was apologizing to her and, and I was like, you know, I still do that. I just love it. I can't not do it. It just, I really love going in the appointments. And she was like, Adam, thank you. She was like, I just left to buy her appointment. She's like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> she's like, I just, I finished the appointment. I high-fived them and I got my car and I felt so good. And so I'm I telling you I literally just that. went on a listing appointment last week, people. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> and I, um, and so I just, I don't know that I'll ever give it up. Yeah, and I know, um, you know, when we're following the process of, you know, getting your team from fifth level to sixth level, to seventh level, I just love going on the appointments. And so I haven't given them up. I still have two um, listing agents. So they go on all of our haven't met appointments. I'm still dealing with Mets, um, previous clients or maybe a personal referral. And, you know, where, where I can walk in and just grab the paperwork and walk out, mm -hmm. you know. What, what percentage of the business? So if you take your 618 at the hub, how no. many of those did you sell? Claire, do you know that answer? I don't know the answer. I feel like it was around a hundred. Okay. That's a healthy, yeah. healthy percentage. Yeah. And that included like some lots, like he said, some of his personal mm -hmm. referrals, like some of that mm -hmm. business, but yeah. Or a building yeah. that we work with that will call mm -hmm. and say, Hey, I've identified these many lots in the subdivision. I want to write contracts on, you know, like, there's no yeah. way to refer that out. My admin take care of it. And yeah, and those, totally. It, those just easily go under me. Oh, I, I think that's, I think that's great. I mean, um, Ben Kinney um, and myself, we, we both still sell one or one or two a month, depending. And um, uh, I think we always will. It keeps, for me, it keeps me in the transaction, makes me better at this because, sure. you know, I it's still, I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm getting offers in as we speak on a listing, right? Keeps me super relevant. And, um, and I think it makes us better leaders when we're a player coach. 
and, you know, it helps the bottom line. It's really good for profit margin when the owner, you know, of the team stays in production. So we, we have about two minutes left. Um, this is a tough market to get listings in. It's competitive. It's crazy. Um, what, what would Claire, your number one advice be in lead generating for appointments? And then Adam, what would your number one advice be now on converting those appointments, you know, to get listings? Claire, let's start with you. Yeah. So, you know, I would say, um, keep in touch with people, you know, don't, don't call them and then forget about them for six months. Like call them set a reminder, calendar event, note on your phone, whatever you need to do and call them again in a month or two. And um, that's the goal. Most conversions happen at five, six, seven, eight conversations. And so it might feel overwhelming to start that now, but you'll be thankful five, six, seven, eight months now uh, when you have great business because of all the phone calls that you made. So I just love call, that. don't do one call. 80% of sales are made after the fifth contact, the fifth conversation. Yeah. All right, Adam, you're going to, you're going to bring us up. Bring so, us up um, you know, uh, when, when you think about going on listing appointments and having a script, right. And a, uh, a set, um, transition from A to Z that from the second you walk to the door, everything that's going to happen. I have found very valuable this year to be able, you know, now that I've mastered that, to be able to keep a lot of that out of the equation and go right to asking great questions and figuring out what their objection is. Uh, the objections are way different than they have been ever. And it, and it kind of started at COVID, you know, whether that was actually um, the cause of it or not. It was just about two years ago that it started. And, the, you know, the market kind of shifted as far as the sellers are concerned and the things that they were concerned about um, that they had never brought me those objections before. And so it's really getting in, asking great questions, going deep on those concerns, finding out why that's important. And then I'm able to solve their problem a lot quicker. Instead yeah. of, I think, some of the people that I'm going up and competing against that are coming in with this basic script and going A to Z and I'm able to kind of run circles around them because I'm able to stop, talk to them only about the things that are important to them mm -hmm. and then move forward. And so it's really asking great questions. Always. I think that's asking the perfect enough. place to end it. Yeah. It's about asking great questions. I agree with you. I think that what I, the only thing I would add to that is because I am going on a ton of listening appointments again, um, is that I'm finding that, um, you know, just remember you're, you're, you're partnering with the homeowner. You're not dictating, you're not, this is a partnership and I make them feel like it's a partnership. You know, I'm going to, uh, you know, different scripts I've been using lately are, you know, Adam, I'm going to guide you. You're the, you're the homeowner. Um, this is really where I see list price. And this is why this is our strategy. This is why if it were my house, that's what I would do. And you know what? Um, let's talk about it. If you see the data another way that I don't, we're going to go into this together. And I think they appreciate that. I think that, you know, the old days of coming in, the, the world's changed. We don't come in and order them around and tell them what to do anymore, right? So it's a, remember that, that they're viewing you as a strategic partner in this home sale. I take leadership, but I'm also their partner. And so I, I would say that's what I'm feeling the most in this market right now. Like, let's enter this together, right? You, let's make you feel comfortable. You trust me. I'm leading the show. I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to honor and listen to you and under, and, you know, make your needs met as well. So I think that's really accurate. Well said. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you for um, uh, all of you um, today, especially we want to thank Chris and Gina Callahan and, and um, hopefully um, uh, by now you've seen the information so that you can reach out to your local senators. Uh, you know, I, it breaks my heart to think that there's 300 children that, that could be in, in homes away from, from war and away from the stress they're probably going through. So, so I urge you to, to help that. And um, uh, Springfield, Missouri, it is a battle. We've got, we've got, you know, Adam and Claire and we got Jen Davis. <laughs> so, you know, we love you both. Yeah. So. We love you both. So anyway, but if you have any business in Springfield, Missouri, then you know who to call because you guys are in front of me right now. So did I just like drop a gauntlet? Maybe we should have a script off with the two. Yeah, we teams. should. We Ooh, should. I just did one with Michael Perna and Richard Schulman. We are uh, going to do you and Jen Davis. 1000% we're doing that. You are going to be our next quarter script off. It's a done deal. Like okay. that's happening. Okay. We're going to do that. 
All right, everybody, we'll have a great week and we will see you here next Wednesday at Hanford.